Hello and welcome to a summary of all you need to know about Benjamin Zephaniah's essay, Young and Dyslexic, You've Got It Going On. Now I will read and explain this essay that he's written in depth and the version that I'll be reading is what appears in the Pearson Edexcel International GCSE Anthology. I'll explain the meaning related to what he's written and language techniques that he's used, which you should be aware of if you're writing about this essay and especially about what he is writing about relating to dyslexia. And I'm going to go over especially some of the contextual factors that also you need to be aware of when it comes to understanding this essay. So let's get started. Now what I'll do is I'll break the essay up into separate chunks and read through them and then point out and highlight into interesting techniques that he has used. So bear in mind that this article has been published in The Guardian Online, which is an online newspaper, and it was published in 2015, and it was adapted from his contribution to another text called Creative Successful Dyslexic, okay? So hence why this passage really focuses on dyslexia. So I'm going to begin by reading and then I'll pause and talk about interesting techniques from this chunk of the extract. As a child, I suffered, but learned to turn dyslexia to my advantage, to see the world more creatively. We are the architects, we are the designers. I'm of the generation where teachers didn't know what dyslexia was. The big problem with the education system then was that there was no compassion, no understanding and no humanity. I don't look back and feel angry with the teachers. The ones who wanted to have an individual approach weren't allowed to. The idea of being kind and thoughtful and listening to problems just wasn't done. The past is a different kind of country. At school, my ideas always contradicted the teachers. I remember one teacher saying that human beings sleep for one third of their life and I put my hand up and said, if there's a God, isn't that a design fault? If you built something, you want efficiency. If I was God, I would have designed sleep so we could stay awake then good people could do one third more good in the world. The teacher said, shut up, stupid boy. Bad people will do one third more bad. I thought I'd put in a good idea. I was just being creative. She also had a point, but the thing was, she called me stupid for even thinking about it. I remember a teacher talking about Africa and the local savages, and I would say, who are you to talk about savages? She would say, how dare you challenge me? And that would get me into trouble. So this opening is really, really powerful. It essentially establishes Benjamin Zephaniah. So if you haven't been familiar with any of his writing, he is a very successful and fairly famous poet and author in the UK. However, of course, his novels have been quite best-selling around the world. And it's interesting that he mentions the concept of dyslexia because dyslexia is related to uh, a disability relating to reading. And so interestingly, a lot of people don't necessarily link this this disability with somebody who's actually a very talented writer. So of course, what he's doing is changing our conception around the issue of dyslexia. So he opens with a really emotive language. He talks about how he suffered initially, how perhaps the idea of dyslexia was not necessarily understood as he was growing up, and hence he found it really, really challenging. And also, the abstract noun dyslexia, not only is it interesting, it focuses our intention instantly from the start on this disability which actually he turned to his advantage and how we can all turn this to our advantage but of course the repetition of this abstract noun reinforces a central focus of this essay which is to do with dyslexia and also perhaps removing myths surrounding dyslexia. He then uses the personal pronoun my to really show that he's taking more power back, he's becoming more empowered. He then uses a really interesting rhetorical technique, which he repeats the exact phrase at the end of the passage. You're going to see it. He says, we are the architects, we are the designers. Again, this couples with the personal pronoun, putting back power in his hands, but equally by extension, what he's trying to say is that if you suffer from dyslexia, actually, that's not something you should find discouraging. You should feel really empowered. That makes you unique. He then mentions the education system and this abstract noun really highlights a systemic issue, an issue with the education system that really disempowers dyslexic people and really makes them underachieve rather than get the maximum out of their potential. He then emphasises this with the tricolon, no compassion, no understanding, no humanity and of course the repetition of no show how the education system really stacks the odds against both him but also by extension against dyslexia 
dyslexic people and of course what he wants to do is change this also his use of polysyndeton kind and thoughtful and listening again this further emphasizes how to some extent it's not always the teacher's fault and especially during his time it wasn't always exclusively to teachers that were at fault actually also the education system just didn't really give them much room to really feel empathy for their students and of course this polysyndeton is the direct opposite of the above which is no compassion no understanding no humanity now of course what this is showing is just how difficult it was as he was growing up through the education system. The odds were really highly stacked against him. He then even emphasizes this and emphasizes, you know, how the past, of course, he's a little bit older. He just shows through this metaphor how the past was vastly different and probably even worse than what the education system is today. But of course, he also still emphasizes that today there's still not that much room that's given to dyslexic people. And of course, that needs to change. He then contrasts the personal pronoun my with the common noun teachers and what this does is it creates an us versus them dynamics. The teachers are basically the institution, they represent the institution that he is being forced to stand up against and he of course is quite powerless in their face and on top of that he then struggles with dyslexia so he's really at a massive disadvantage. He then repeats the statistic that the teacher taught them. One third of their life people spend sleeping. And of course, the teacher tells him off. Then he then repeats the conditional clause if and emphasizes if I was God, I would have designed sleep so we could stay awake. And of course, this shows that he is able to think independently and question authority. However, this bold statement, which questions accepted wisdom, is seen as really bad. Again, this is showing the education system just only rewards students who passively take in information and just regurgitate and say the same information rather than actually questioning wisdom and saying, hang on can things be changed and of course this is emphasized again when the teacher tells him off the sibilance shut up and stupid is really harsh and brutal he's a young child and the teacher is really really bruising his ego and he does he does so in response to just Zephaniah asking something relating to just accepted wisdom, just exercising some creativity. And again, this shows just how difficult his life was as he was going through the education system. Furthermore, the repetition of the word bad, so bad people will do one third more bad. This actually shows whilst Zephaniah has a very positive worldview, he's quite optimistic. Actually, the teacher that told him off had a really negative worldview and he was trying to pass on this negative worldview to Zephaniah. Also, the simple sentence, I was just being creative, highlights the creative gift that Zephaniah had, but he wasn't aware of and it was being crushed. Moreover, he emphasizes once more not only the systemic educational issues in the education system, but also how racism really exists in the education system, and especially as he was being taught. He uses animalistic language that Africa has local savages. And again, Zephaniah himself, so this is important context, he is of Caribbean descent. He's a black man. Therefore, he is being taught to accept information that actually looks down on people of his ethnicity. And of, again, he's questioning this and he's thinking about all the teachers that are basically teaching him very racist ideas about Africans. And then if he challenges, he then talks about and uses that reported speech here. And he says that the teacher would say, how dare you challenge me? Again, the teachers really outcast him and get really angry at him for questioning any of this information. So let's carry on with the rest of the passage. Once, when I was finding it difficult to engage with writing and had asked for some help, a teacher said, it's all right, we can't all be intelligent, but you'll end up being a good sports person, so why don't you go outside and play some football? I thought, oh great, but now I realise he was stereotyping me. I had poems in my head even then, and when I was 10 or 11, my sister wrote some of them down for me. When I was 13, I could read very basically, but it would be such hard work that I would give up. I thought that, so long as you could read how much the banknote was worth, you knew enough, or you could ask a mate. I got thrown out of a lot of schools, the last one at 13. I was expelled, partly because of arguing with teachers on an intellectual level, and partly for being a rude boy and fighting. I didn't stab anybody, 
but I did take revenge on a teacher once. I stole his car and drove it into his front garden. I remember him telling us the Nazis weren't that bad. He could say that in the classroom. When I was in Borstal, I used to do this thing of looking at people I didn't want to be like. I saw a guy who spent all his time sitting stooped over and I thought, I don't want to be like that. So I learned to sit with a straight back. Being observant helped me make the right choices. A high percentage of the prison population are dyslexic and a high percentage of the architect population. If you look at the statistics, I should be in prison. A black man, brought up on the wrong side of town, his family fell apart, in trouble with the police when I was a kid, unable to read and write, with no qualifications and, on top of that, dyslexic. But I think staying out of prison is about conquering your fears and finding your path in life. Now this passage becomes even more powerful. So he mentions when his teacher says, we can't all be intelligent, but you end up being a good sports person. So why don't you go outside and play some football? And this patronizing question really shows that the teachers had very racist stereotypes. And of course this touches on the stereotype that all black people are not intellectuals. They don't belong in academia or in work that requires using the brain. Instead, they should be athletes, performers. And once more, this is again, part of what he was being taught as a young person. And of course his naive response when he says, oh great, this is a minor sentence again, showing that he was being indoctrinated to see himself in this way, to see himself as not necessarily intelligent enough to do much academic work, but instead play sports. And, but then later, of course, he realizes he's being stereotyped. Then he talks about later on how he had poems in his head, even when he was being stereotyped. And this abstract noun is a contrast to sports. He was an intellectual. He didn't realize it, but the, also the education system didn't encourage him to bring out this side of him. Also, he uses the adverb basically to talk about how he reads. And this shows then that he had very rudimentary reading skills. And this was, of course, as a result of how reading would be such hard work. He even says, I would give up. And of course, this is really saddening. He doesn't realize the gift that's innate within him when it comes to writing. And he doesn't also have an encouraging system, which has teachers that encourage him to try harder. Also, the second person pronoun you shows how he rationalizes how much the banknote was worth. So he basically explains, okay, hang on, as long as I just know the basic survival skills, as long as I can read a banknote, this focuses only on very basic survival. He doesn't, he you thinks reading is only limited to just survival skills and no more, which of course, again, is really saddening, especially because he's so talented as a writer, which he discovers much later on. He then also uses colloquial language throughout this passage, colloquial language meaning casual language. He talks about a mate. And again, this makes this article really relatable to us as readers. It shows that he doesn't take himself too seriously, but also he becomes very likable to us. He then mentions how he got thrown out of a lot of school. And of course, the violent verb thrown shows that he was being discarded from a very young age with the education system. There's no way he could have won. And on top of that, we learned that he was very defiant to authority. He was arguing with teachers. He didn't necessarily always accept what they would tell him, but this then put him at a further disadvantage. Again, he uses more colloquial language here. He talks about his street credibility, a rude boy. And in case you're not familiar with the idea of a rude boy, it's just a colloquial term, which is especially popular in London, which talks about young boys who uh, sometimes are in gangs, but have a lot of street respect, but are not necessarily always academic. But of course, the sad thing is that a lot of these people who are in the street sometimes do end up in prison, unfortunately. He then mentions how his, he stole his teacher's car and drove it to his front garden. And so this complex sentence kind of surprises us because we realize that he's getting into a little bit of delinquent activity, but then he justifies it by saying that the teacher thought the Nazis weren't bad. And of course, this reference to taboo, of course, the Nazis being led by Hitler, who killed over 6 million Jews in the Holocaust. This is shocking for us because we realize actually his teacher deserved it. How can the teacher show that it was race, a racist man wasn't very bad? Furthermore, we, he uses monosyllabic language to relate to his internal dialogue. He thought, I don't want to be like that. And again, this makes Zephaniah really relatable to us as readers. Furthermore, it's really interesting that he uses alliteration to talk about the prison population being dyslexic, which of course is a very tragic reality. 
But he uses an interesting form of parallelism here to also say, whilst on the one hand you have a lot of people who are dyslexic who are in prison unfortunately, there's also a lot of architects, very creative people who also are dyslexic. So actually, if you're dyslexic, you could go either way. You're not destined for a life of misery, a life of poverty, a life in the prison. You can also be destined to be a very successful architect. You're not limited in your choices. Also, of course, again, he keeps on repeating the emphasis on dyslexia. Again, this reinforces our focus on the core topic of dyslexia as not being disempowering. Furthermore, the adjective that he uses to describe how he grew up on the wrong side of town shows that also he faced a lot of other challenges. Perhaps he grew up in a very rough place whereby he might have fallen into bad gang activity. Of course, we also learned that his family fell apart. So he had a lot of early challenges. But what this does actually, rather than making us only purely feel sympathy, we also feel empowered. We realize that just because we've got our own challenges, we can overcome them and become really successful. Also, again, he uses more colloquial language. He says, when I was a kid, again all of this does is it makes him very relatable we as readers feel like we can sit down with him we can see ourselves in his position but of course equally you can also see that we can grow and improve and he reinforces the message which is to do with conquering your fears and finding your path in life and of course this is reinforced by the second pronoun person pronoun your which for us as readers we feel like he's directly addressing us and this really engages us so let's carry on when I go into prisons to talk to people, I see men and women who, in intelligence and other qualities, are the same as me. But opportunities are open for me, and they miss theirs, didn't notice them, or didn't take them. I never thought I was stupid. I didn't have that struggle. If I have someone in front of me who doesn't have a problem reading and writing telling me that black people are savages, I just think, I'm not stupid. You're the one that's stupid. I just had self-belief. For my first book, I told my poems to my girlfriend, who wrote them down for me. It really took off, especially within the black community. I wrote with love, for with love. People don't think they were dyslexic poems. They just thought I wrote phonetically. At 21, I went to an adult education class in London to learn to read and write. The teacher told me, you are dyslexic. And I was like, do I need an operation? She explained to me what it meant. And I suddenly thought, ah, oh, I get it. I thought I was going crazy. I wrote more poetry, novels for teenagers, plays, other books and recorded music. I take poetry to people who do not read poetry. Still now, when I'm writing the word not, I have to stop and think, how do I write that? I have to draw some things to let me know what the word is to come back to it later. If I can't spell question, I just put a question mark and come back to it later. So here in this part of the passage, he begins by focusing and shifting perspective from us. So previously he was talking about your to now he uses first person pronoun I, where we can now start seeing things through his eyes. Also, his grouping of people here when he's talking about men and women shows that this is a greater universal issue that he's addressing. This is a critical issue. And there's so many people who really fall by the wayside purely because they take on the very faulty belief that just because they're dyslexic, they are silly, which is not the case. Also, he uses the abstract noun opportunities to just explain how some people, rather than becoming architects as a result of their dyslexia, actually end up in the prison. And it's simply because they just missed out on opportunities, which he was fortunate enough. And of course, he uses here tricolon. He says he, they missed theirs, didn't notice them or didn't take them. And this emphasizes how Zephaniah himself also realizes he was both proactive. He took advantage of the opportunities, but also he was partly quite lucky as well also his repetition of the word stupid adds a tone of humor he is basically mocking people who have this very narrow-minded view of dyslexic people dyslexic people are not stupid in fact those people who believe this are the ones who are stupid also the simple sentence i just had self-belief shows this is part of the reason why he's successful why he overcame all of these challenges he simply had a strong belief within himself that he could overcome also, he uses and refers to the black community. Again, contextually, this relates back to his own community. And he mentions the definite article, the, and the collective pronoun, black and especially community, which shows how his poetry is so impactful for other black people, other Caribbean people who don't necessarily feel very represented in more mainstream writing. 
He also talks about how he phonetically wrote and even still today he writes phonetically with love instead of with love. And remember, phonetic spelling is just writing as the way someone pronounces. And it's interesting, this phonetic spelling is actually what made him really famous. It made his writing really unique. And top of that, this compound sentence is quite humorous. Again, it ties into how his writing, which initially he thought was really silly, actually is what made him very unique and very successful. Furthermore, the dialogue here, where his teacher tells him later on when he's an adult learner, so he takes himself back to school, the teacher tells him, you're dyslexic, and then he responds by saying, do I need an operation? This dialogue is really humorous and quite disarming. Again, it just shows that he doesn't take himself too seriously, but also doesn't become disempowered by what he sees as something that he has to work doubly hard for, which is writing, reading, and he goes into this. Now, once he realises and understands his dyslexia, this declarative sentence, I wrote more poetry, novels for teenagers, plays and other books and recorded music. This shows he had an epiphany. And after this epiphany, this opened a whole new world for him. And he then f had so much frenzied activity. He started writing, indulging in all of creative work. And on top of that, he started getting into music. He really learning that he wasn't necessarily um, silly. He just had a condition which he could easily overcome. This is what really was a turning point for him. Furthermore, the repetition of the word prone, uh, poetry shows that especially the fact that he takes this as to the black community, to people who would otherwise not read poetry, not only of course black people, this could be also young children who don't necessarily like mainstream poetry, this could be people from other communities. What he is showing is the role that Zephaniah plays almost using his poetry, which isn't too mainstream in terms of it, the way he writes. He's spreading it like a gospel and he himself is the Messiah and he's making more and more people love poetry, even people who otherwise wouldn't read it, people who are dyslexic. Furthermore, the rhetorical question, how do I write that, shows us his internal monologue as he writes and the challenges that he faces. And this again humanizes him. He's not this amazing writer who doesn't have any issues. He still has issues even with spelling. So let's carry on. When I look at a book, the first thing I see is the size of it. And I know that's what it's like for a lot of young people who find reading tough. When Brunel University offered me the job of Professor of Poetry and Creative Writing, I knew my students would be officially more educated than me. I told them, you can do this course and get the right grade because you have a good memory. But if you don't have passion, creativity, individuality, there's no point. In my life now, I find that people accommodate my dyslexia. I can perform my poetry because it doesn't have to be word perfect, but I never read one of my novels in public. When I go to literary festivals, I always get an actor to read it out for me. Otherwise, all my energy goes into reading the book and the mood is lost. If someone can't understand dyslexia, it's their problem. In the same way, if someone oppresses me because of my race, I don't sit down and think, how can I become white? It's not my problem, it's theirs, and they are the ones who have to come to terms with it. If you're dyslexic and you feel there's something holding you back, just remember, it's not you. In many ways, being dyslexic is a natural way to be. What's unnatural is the way we read and write. If you look at a pictorial language like Chinese, you can see the word for woman because the character looks like a woman. The word for a house looks like a house. It's a strange step to go from that to a squiggle that represents a sound. So now in this part of the passage, he now shows how he's become a professor himself. He's become a teacher and this is ironic. So the proper noun Brunel University, referring to one of the really good universities in the UK. This use of proper noun is quite ironic as now he's in the teacher's shoes. These teachers who, when he was young, oppressed him. He's now the tables have turned. He's become powerful. But actually, instead of using his power to oppress other students, he's using it to empower them. Furthermore, he talks about his title, Professor of Poetry and Creative Writing. So this is really interesting because he doesn't capitalise the word professor and the title poetry and creative writing. He doesn't use capital letters to refer to his title because he doesn't think of himself above his students. Actually, he's downplaying his job. Once more, this is showing how humble he is and he, this makes him far more human, far more likeable to us. Also, the possessive noun, my, when he talks about my students, shows that he takes a lot of ownership in his work, but also a lot of pride in teaching and empowering his students. Furthermore, this tricode on passion, creativity, individuality, this shows how vital this is when it comes to doing really, really well. And he's trying to teach this to his students, not just simply teach them to memorize things passively. Also, he says what, when he goes to literary festivals, he gets somebody else to read his work for him. And this complex sentence shows just how much humility he 
has as he deliberately downplays his achievements and doesn't make it about him. It doesn't make his work all about him. Also, the repetition of the pronoun someone is interesting because it's showing that he is thinking of other people who might be, you know, ignorant of his race, ignorant of where he comes from, but actually that's their problem. Furthermore, the rhetorical question, how can I become white? This is dark humour that he's using, which emphasises just how absurd and silly racism is. Furthermore, the repetition of the second person pronouns here is a direct address back to us as readers. It makes us feel empowered. And again, he shows that we can learn something from his journey. Furthermore, he uses simple, relatable similes. So he talks about pictorial language like Chinese to show how actually the English reading system and the written English can be actually very unnatural to our learning process. Other pictorial languages like Chinese, languages which use script, actually use a completely different method, which is much easier for a lot of us to understand. Also, the cynic doke that he uses here, so squiggle that represents a sound as well as sibilance. Again, he goes into detail of different types of language to just emphasize how English can be inherently quite hard. So let's finish off with this final two paragraphs. So don't be heavy on yourself. And if you're a parent of someone with dyslexia, don't think of it as a defect. Dyslexia is not a measure of intelligence. You may have a genius on your hands. Having dyslexia can make you creative. If you want to construct a sentence and can't find the word you're searching for, you have to think a way to make right around it. This requires being creative and so your creativity muscle gets bigger. Kids come up to me and say, I'm dyslexic too, and I say to them, Use it to your advantage and see the world differently. Us dyslexic people, we've got it going on. We are the architects, we are the designers. It's like these kids are proud to be like me. And if that helps them, that's great. I don't have that as a child. I say to them, bloody non-dyslexics, who do they think they are? This is a really, really positive way to end his essay and to really empower dyslexic people. So here, again, he continues encouraging us as readers. He uses this imperative sentence to just say, you know, if you've got dyslexia, do not be hard on yourself. Don't be angry if you find it really challenging to read certain passages. Just give yourself that time and space. Also, this declarative sentence, have a dyslexic and make you more creative. What this does is it offers a lot of dyslexic people hope. It shows that just like Zephaniah, they can overcome the challenges when it comes to reading and become extremely successful writers, authors, and just successful people as a whole. Again, the repetition of the word kids, this colloquial language shows just how impactful he is even on younger people, younger people who have dyslexia that can look up to him, which is really powerful. He talks about how these children, they use very simple Lexis, and Lexis just means language, words. And they come up to him and just say, I'm dyslexic too. And fortunately for them, they have a role model that they can see who's actually made it in life, who's done so well. And he's done well with his dyslexia. It's, it's an asset for Zephaniah. As I mentioned at the start of the analysis, he repeats this phrase again. So at the beginning of the passage and now at the end, he repeats, we are the architects, we are the designers. And this is a rhetorical technique to emphasize the power that dyslexic people have. Also he uses a lot of colloquial language and a lot of Americanisms. So this is kind of language related to American speaking. So he says, it's like these kids. And again, what this does is it makes this passage far more relatable. Then he uses the mild expletive bloody. Expletive just means like a swear word. Of course, this isn't a very strong swear word, but he does so to add like a playful tone towards the end of his passage. And then he ends with the rhetorical question, who do they think they are? Again, making fun of non-dyslexics, almost as if they are the group of people that dyslexic people have to feel sorry for. They don't have to go through this complex journey of growth, development. Actually, they think even if they think they're better than dyslexic people, actually, they're very silly. So he ends on a really, really positive note. So that's all. If you found this video useful, do make sure you visit our website, which is www.firstrateteachers.com. There you can find lots of useful study review guides and study material to help you when analysing this and indeed other texts in English. Thank you so much for listening.